So, right, cool. Okay, let's click. Got it. Do, do, do. All right, all right. Hello. Okay, let's start. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Wei Jiegan. I am now the fourth year PhD student at Washington University in Santa Luis. Uh, I'm so happy to give a talk today here. The topic is learning under exact data and model for computational imaging. So computational imaging is basically a really big topic and I will uh, straight jump into my research focus. Yep. My research focus is in inverse problem. The reasons we are, I'm interested in inverse problem because many imaging problem can be formulated as inverse problem. For example, problems in image restoration, in biomedical imaging, and so on and so on. But what is inverse problem, right? So think about a general process of imaging a subject. You first have a subject, you usually call like a ground truth, and you have your imaging model. Sometimes we also call it like a form model that corresponds to the imaging hardware. And we also consider some measurement noise. And what we actually get from the device or from the hardware is we call like a measurement. We use the equation y equals to a theta x plus e to represent the measurement. But measurement is not something we actually want. We want the images itself, right? So in order to recover the images from the measurement, we need to solve a problem called inverse problem. So that's basically the main topic I have been working on during my PhD. So there are many ways to solve the inverse problem. One of the common approach is to think about have an estimator of a minimal mean square error or MMSE estimator. In practice, this uh, MMSE estimator can be obtained by training neural network, a deep neural network that maps the measurements to the desired high quality images. Um, and here's uh, just a visual example here. It's very quick visual example. You put the Y or measurement to a neural network, you get the reconstruction, and you have a loss function that compute the loss between the network prediction and the label here. There's one remark. It usually relies on supervised learning to train it, which means you need the high quality images as the reference. And that's the first challenge I will mention here is that in order to get such an MMSE estimator in practice, you need an exact pair of data of measurements that ground to do that. And there's another way to do that. We call like a maximum posterior estimator. It basically means you are going to get or you are going to recover images that can maximize the posterior. And if we use the base rule, the posterior can be formulated as a, a summation of a log maximum, sorry, the log likelihood and the log imaging prior. And once we get this formulation, we can further formulate the optimization that your objective has the GX and HX. And in this optimization, your GS usually represent the physical model that infuses information from the full model A theta. And there's a common term of a data fidelity term or like GX here is a L2 norm between A theta X minus Y. Uh, and the image in prior usually represents some uh, predefined function that we can explore the information from the, the prior knowledge about the images. So here I want to highlight the second challenge in this uh, maximum posterior estimator is that you need to have an exact form model A theta to run this algorithm to solve this optimization. So here's basically the outline of my the, the talk. So first I want, to, I want to say that my research focus on deep learning based method for inverse problem from access of algorithm theory application. And there's a two topic in the rest of today's talk, which corresponds to one challenge I just mentioned. The first things, the first challenge is you require an exact pair of a measurement and ground truth data for training. So this is the first topic, learning on exact data, which is the self-supervised learning. How can we train neural network if we don't have the ground truth? That's the first topic I will cover. The second topic I will cover corresponds to the second challenge I just mentioned is that you need the exact form of the A theta. So the second topic is learning on an exact model, which means you are you don't have the uh, exact information of the form model, you are going to jointly recover the images and whatever uncertainty inside the form model. So that's the second topic. So let's start from the first topic, the self-supervised. Let me start from uh, 
application, and then we we'll talk about why I'm interested in the self supervised learning. So yeah, a very specific application of MRI called free breathing 4D liver MRI. Unlike other MRI, this 4D MRI allows patients to breathe during the scanning. So in the, as you can see my mouse here, so this figure represents the breathing signal of a patient. So the Y axis represents the inhale and exhale of the breathing the stage. And the really small blue point here represents the measurement. So this is the measurement we, we can acquire from the scanner. What that means is that all the, the measurement will contain the information or contain the measurement from the different breathing stage. The common practice is not to reconstruct this whole measurement at once. Rather, we will do something we call like a measurement binning. We will try to bin the measurement into many, many small pieces. Each piece corresponds to the same breathing stage. For example, here, y equal, y t equals to one corresponds to exhale of the breathing. And then we, we also have like y uh, t equals to two and so on and so on. The reason we need to do that is because if you do a direct reconstruction, like we call like MC and NUFFT here, it represents multi-coil non-uniform inverse fast Fourier transform. If you do it for the whole y, you will end up a, a uh, images that is buried in the in the in the edges. For example, this is the liver. So you can see the detail inside the liver is a little bit buried. On the other hand, if you reconstruct the the measurement after you do a measurement binning, you actually get a much sharper images, especially the details inside the liver. However, the issue is that the binning is essentially doing subsampling. So from the images or the video in the right side, you will see there's a lot of a noise artifacts and streaking artifacts due to the subsampling. And also this measurement binning prolongs the whole scanning time. So here's like a five minute scanning. So five minutes in MI is not too short, but if you look at the image in the right side, the quality is not good. So think about if you are going to train neural network to do that, it will take you really, really long time to have a high quality ground true. I'm talking about like maybe 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and that will be too long for MI. So the challenge is that how to train neural network for 4D liver MI reconstruction without ground truth. Um, we are adopting an algorithm based on noise to noise. So I'm talking about a little bit about background noise to noise if you are not familiar with this topic. So noise to noise provide a fundamental algorithm for training the noise that we are ground truth. So we consider a denoising problem. In the framework of inverse problem, the denoising problem can be formulated as a theta equals to i is the identity matrix. The noise to noise training, the central piece that it consider two noisy images of the same ground truth. So as here's the imaging model. You have the same ground truth x i. I here represent the index of a training sample, but you have a different noise realization. You have e i and you have e i prime. So you have a two different noise noisy images, but they correspond to the same ground truth. The training, at least in practice, is very really straightforward. You just given one noise images, you put it in a neural network, and ask the neural network to predict and other noisy images. So that's the idea of the noise to noise. But how noise to noise correspond to our 4D liver MI? Here's our empirical understanding about the data. So we notice that the neighboring phrase can be empirically considered as a different noisy realization of the same images because of the motion is so small that we can just ignore it. And also the artifacts in the subsampling measurement are basically just Gaussian noise. So the images in the top row here show you the, the images for the neighboring phrases, like t equal to one, t equal to two. So you can see the difference small, meaning that the motion is small. And the bottom images here show you the undersample reconstruction. The t equals one, t equal to two. You can see the difference here are basically just Gaussian noise. Of course, there's some straight artifacts, but we could discuss it later. And based on this observation, we can have a quite an approximate imaging model. You can think about the measurement or the images in the t equals to one is just y equals to x plus e. It just grown through at some noise here. And in the t equals to two, the neighboring phrases, you can think about it's a grown true, it's a transformed by a motion vector field and then you pass another noise. And in these cases, we assume that the motion vector field is so small that you can ignore it. 
By this, by using this approximate image learning model, we introduce the idea of face to face. We published this paper in a um, kind of a high impact medical journal in 2021. The idea is simple, but also powerful. The idea is as follows. So think about you have a set of 3D slides. So each, each image is a 3D volume. So it contains all the briefing stage. Say this is t equals to one, this is t equals to two. And you do a partition in a temporal dimension. You partition into two pieces. The first pieces corresponds to all the even faces and the other pieces correspond to all the odd faces. And once you get this two new 3D volume, you can follow what noise to noise has been done. You just put the Y even, for example, as an input of a neural network and ask it to predict the Y odd. And that's the idea of noise to noise. And this simple algorithm actually provide a pretty good results. So here's a result of a face-to-face -face compare again some traditional algorithm, including a direct reconstruction, MCN NFT, and those based on the sparsity regularizer optimization method. So you can see the noise to noise in the two minutes under sample acquisition can achieve um, noise free and sharp detail in the reconstruction results. So that's face to face. But face to face is, you know, it's, it's approximation. As we know, like any approximation usually lead to suboptimal results. So there's the two things we are, we are considering here. So in this approximate image involving face to face, there's a two issues. First, we note, we notice that the artifacts just not, is not just noise. You also have like a striking artifacts and the artifacts coming from under sampling. And the second, even though the motion is small, we shouldn't just ignore it. So based on that, we think about another image learning model, I call it like a credit and more generalized dynamic image learning model. So there's a two different, the first difference is that you add the four model back. I mean, the A here, you put it back, you consider it. And second, we consider the, the motion vector field phi in these cases, but we no longer assume that it's a, it's, it's, it's a negligible, right? So you, you, you should, we, it's just not a small motion. Um, and to be specific, A and MI basically just model the subsampling in the Fourier domain. And there's a difference between A and A prime. They, they most likely be different from the sampling location. And the application of this new model, of course, cover the, dyna the general dynamic, dynamic imaging. And also, they also may also cover the longitudinal study. And that's our idea of decoron. So the decoron just try to train neural network on this new image learning model. Uh, we published this paper in the 2022 in the IGBE TMI. So the idea is somewhat similar to face to face. So you still have two measurements, Y and Y prime. You put Y into the neural network and get the reconstruction and ask the reconstruction to predict the another measurement Y prime here. So the first thing we could, we could highlight here is that we formulate a loss function in a measurement domain rather than in the imaging domain. However, there's a, there's an issue of course, right? Because the reconstruction of Y is try to approximate the X. But if you look at the imaging model of Y prime, which is our training target, it's actually having the, the motion vector field here, right? Which means the reconstruction of Y doesn't correspond to the ground true or the images in the Y prime. So that's the key idea of decorum. We try to somewhat have a, something we call like a deformation compensation module that can provide us an estimation of the motion vector field so that we could transform the reconstruction of Y such that the, the loss function can match the imaging model. And that's the key idea of the, the decorum. And how are we going to do that? We basically have another neural network. So this neural network is doing image registration. Uh, the idea is as follows. You not only reconstruct the you not only reconstruct the Y, you also reconstruct the Y prime. You put it into a neural network. I think it has uh, just a unit. And then you let it to predict the motion vector field. Uh, it's, a, it's a phi hat. And then we use the spatial transform network to, to implement the transformation operator here so that we could get 
a transformation of the reconstruction of Y, which is this term here. And since it's another neural network, you also need to train it. And the training is, is based on um, similarity loss between the transformation of the reconstruction of Y and the reconstruction of the Y prime. The reason behind that is both these two terms are trying to approximate the, the, the true ground truth transformed it by the true vector field. So this is a similarity loss. I think we used a, a local cross correlation in our implementation. And now we have a two neural network, we have a two loss function, and these two neural network are jointly optimized. The takeaway of a decoron is simple. You just have that learn, you compensate the motion, and you can have a better performance than face to face. Okay, now we talk about a real application, the four deliver MI. We talk about a new algorithm to compensate the motion. And now is that what theoretical insight we could have? So this 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 research question has been answered in our IEEE TCI paper in last year, 2023. It's called self DQ, self supervised deep equivalent model for inverse problem with theoretical guarantee and application to MI reconstruction. It's a very long title, I know. It consider a new imaging model. So this new imaging model is different from the previous model into two factors. So the first thing is that we ignore the, the phi because we are focusing on more general subsampling problem rather than, you know, you have a motion, you have a deformation in the imaging model. We try to simplify the question. The second is that in our previous dynamic imaging model, we consider a general A, which means that the decorant can be applied to any inverse problem in principle. But now we are trying to more focus on MI. So we reformulate the A to make it more problem or more MI specific. And but to be specific, this M and H in MI corresponds to, you know, here. So the AH is like a transformation. It consider a coil sensitivity map and the Fourier transform. And the M here is a sampling operator. So in MRI, there's a two typical way to do a sampling. One is we call a radio sampling. The other is called like a Cartesian sampling. Another benefit of considering this new imaging model is that it kind of a border the way of a data acquisition. In face-to-face, -face, in decorant, we only consider dynamic imaging, which is cool, but it's not generalized enough. But here, in this new model, we can actually have a, another way to get the data. We could, of course, for example, here, the bottom images here, you could do a temporal partition, like what we have done in the face-to-face. -face. But it also opened another opportunity to, to acquire data by doing a partition around the measurement domain. For example, if your original data contains, let's say, 50% of the data, you could do some partition to make Y corresponds to, let's say, 12.5% of the data, and Y prime correspond to also 12.5%, but it's a different part of the 12.5% of the original sample to data. So that's our new, new imaging model. And in order to trade it, it's still the same idea, right? You have your y as the input of a neural network, and then you ask the neural network to predict the y prime. And the four model, sorry, and the loss function is also formulated in the measurement domain rather than in the imaging domain. There's a two remark I could make here. So the first remark is that it's not a simple mean square error loss. It's a weighted uh, uh, MSE loss. So the weighted matrix W here, these cases here, penalize the oversampling in M. And what is oversampling? You think about is if it's a Cartesian sampling, you always have a central sampling region. We usually call like auto calibration signal. And if it's a radio sampling, you also have an oversampling in the very, very central region here. And this is what the weighted matrix try to compensate. And this is another remark. We use a deep equilibrium model to achieve a state of the performance. I wouldn't talk too much about the deep equilibrium model in this, in this talk because we don't have that amount of time. But what I will show you that this is model is, um, think about it's more like an infinite layer of a neural network, but each layer needs to be the same. So you have a same layer and then you just iteratively call that 
that layer or to use that layer. And the layer consists of two parts. The first part is a CNN. The other part is somewhat the optimization to solve the data consistency term, this here. So there's a two remark of this, this places, the algorithm here. And what a theoretical analysis we could make, right? So this is a conclusion, is that under some assumption, we can show that if you train the neural network in a supervised way, the training gradient, Here's the training gradient. The training gradient of your neural network is exactly the same as the training gradient of the supervised learning in an expectation. So it's in expectation way. So it seems like a very strong conclusion, but here's like our experimental results on the simulated data. The blue point here, sorry, the blue curve here is the supervised training. Uh, the left is the left figure is the PSNR invalidation and right is the PSN, uh, SSM invalidation. And the zero, the zero curve here is our weighted self-supervised learning. So you can see how similar the training curve between the weighted self-supervised learning and the supervised learning. And this is our simulation. And we also have our experimental result on the real data. It shows that we achieve the state-of-the-art quantitative and qualitative performance on um, six times acceleration factor in MI reconstruction. We compare with some traditional algorithms, say total variation and UNET, and we also compare against some SOTA at that time. Okay, state-of-the-art state-of-the-art method, stealth supervised training in MI. These two things, uh, and it shows it just shows that our self DQ is is better. That basically the takeaway. All right, now we can close the, uh, the, the first topic and I will jump into the second topic. Uh, learning on the exact model, which is the, I call it like a bright inverse problem. So in this topic, we first record the second way to solve or the second general way to solve the inverse problem, which is the maximum posterior estimator. You have a summation of a log likelihood and then log image in prior, and you have a fault, and then you have an optimization problem consists of a two term, the GX and HX. Um, again, the GX here is we call like a physical model, or sometimes we also call it like a data for theory term, because the goal of this term is to measure the consistency between the estimation and the raw measurement. But unlike, but the key difference, and what I want to say is that. Um, the highlight things here is that we are going to use a learned it prior as an edge. So in my very first beginning slides, I call like edge can be the prior can be some predefined function. But here I want to push it a little bit further. Uh, we are going to discuss a cases that your HS is a learned it prior, it's a deep learning based prior. And more specifically, we are going to use a pre-trained denoiser as the prior. And this idea, some of you may be familiar with, is called uh, P2P, like a plug and play master. The key idea is that you are going to train a denoiser and then use it as a prior. And what is denoiser? So the, the denoiser can be somewhat like you train a reconstruction network. You just add some noise to a ground tree images and you put it in a neural network and ask the neural network to remove the noise. It seems, and the reason behind that, so there's a two reasons behind that. So the main reason behind that is that once you train a denoiser, so this denoiser is actually traded to approximate the ground truth distribution. It's not just a denoiser. You're actually learning an approximated PX here. And this is the first remark. And the other remark is that you can think about like a recent development of a diffusion model. It also relies on denoising to do a generation. So which means the denoiser itself has information about the ground truth. Uh, and once we have the physical model, the GS term, and the uh, learned it prior, in this case is the pre-trained denoiser, we can run our P2P, a prior and prime method. So it's an iterated algorithm. You have a you have a two two block here. The first block is going to penalize the data consistency. It used the information of a GX, and this is the, the red box here. And the other is like a, a, sorry, the green box. 
And the red box here, you are have you are going to use the denoiser to predict the denoised images. And as I say, it's an iterative algorithm. Right? You start from x0, you run one step of the green box, and then one step of the red box, which is data for data term, the trade denoiser, and then you jump back to green box, data for data term, denoiser, and do it so on and so on until you get the results. Uh, this example of a plug and play in imaging inverse problem. So here's an example of just training a single denoiser, just one denoiser. You can use it to solve different super resolution problem. So the result on the left is the super resolution of a two times, like two times super resolution, and then the result on the right side is a four times super resolution. And the other, another example of a plug and play I would like to highlight here is we apply this algorithm also in the deformable image registration in DCS throughout uh, DCS ICLR. Actually, it's like a couple of days later. So it's here's just an example. So I just keep really how you go through it. So uh, the idea of a deformable image registration is try to solve a vector field that map the move image to the fixed image. Actually, the, the equation may be a little bit wrong here, but the thing about you have two images, F and M, and you are going to solve a map vector field that can help you map one image to another. I wouldn't go too detail about how this algorithm works, but think about, I just want to introduce you the iteration of our algorithm. So this, this, this iteration consists of, of course, a learned denoiser of the registration field, and you also have a green box to represent data consistency. But in registration, the data consistency is not the MSE, but somewhat is called like a global cross correlation. So it's the first plug and play method for image registration. And it's a simple, but we show that we could achieve the state of the art performance. Uh, and if you are going to join the ICLR, like a couple of days later, you could check our poster. I think I just, uh, our poster is like a made night afternoon. Um, and here's a, just a, a video. So, okay. Now we can go back to the to the, to the PMP. So in PMP, so there's a the it can uh beside the portrait noise, right? Those those are important. Um, another important piece of a PMP or let's say maximum or posterior estimator or the optimization is this data fertility term. However, in many imaging inverse problem, in this data fertility term, or let's specifically in the form model A theta here, you have something we call like a four model parameter theta here. Let's say in MI, you will have a coil sensitivity map. And in let's say uh, imaging deburring, you have the Burry kernel. You don't necessarily know the exact information of the theta. And if you don't know it, the result could be suboptimal. Here's a result for PNP using inexact coil sensitivity and exact coil sensitivity in, in PNP. Right, so this PMP oracle theta here means that you use the ground true theta in the form model in the algorithm. The result is good, but this one is a PMP, which means you have the inexact information of the form model. And you can see the performance is suboptimal. You have some error in the reconstruction. And, and the images in the left side show you what is the, how the ground true theta or let's say coil sensitivity looks like in the MI. And the left is how the inexact coil sensitivity may look like in MI. So if we don't know the inexact theta in the form model, how are we going to solve the inverse problem? The idea is called like a bright inverse problem. It basically aims to jointly estimate images and the form model unknowns. So you just need to put the theta as another variable so you need to optimize in the problem and you re and then you reformulate the, the data for data term, the G here, and you add another prior as the uh, form model unknown. And for this bright inverse problem, we had a paper in last year, uh, New Earth. It's called like a block coordinate plug and play master for bright inverse problem. The key idea is to use pre-trained denoise as a prior for images as well as the prior of the form model unknown, right? Because previously I say, you know, you could use pre-trained denoiser in images, but here in the BCPMP, we push the, we push the limit further. We all say, hey, you could also use 
portray the noiser for the four model unknown. And that's the idea of a BCPMP for solving price inverse problem. And here's a little bit technical details here. We can start from, let's say, block coordinate methods, if you some of you are not familiar with that. So in block coordinates method, you first consider a decomposition of an unknown vector. Say you have a vector you want to optimize, it's called V, and you can decompose it into many, many pieces. Let's say V1, V2, until you have VB. And for each V, each small block of your variable have its own gradient in the data fidelity term and has its own denoiser. It's called like block gradient and block denoiser. And what BCPMP do or what block coordinate algorithm using denoiser as a prior do is to update one block at a time. Meaning that in each iteration, so first is the iterative algorithm. So in each iteration, you just render a pick one block and then you run PMP. And when I say run PMP, I mean you first run the physical model, followed it by the learned prior. In this case, it's learned denoiser. And how this block coordinate method related to bright inverse problem? Because the sample form of a bright inverse problem can be considered as a block coordinate descent or block coordinate method by having only two blocks. The first block is the images and the other block is the theta. Let me give you some visual illustration. So here's a block coordinate descent for non-bright inverse problem, like general inverse problem. You only need to update the images. So every time you update one block until you update the whole images until, the, until you converge, right? And here's an example of block coordinate descent or block coordinate method for bright inverse problem. You only have a two block. The first block is the images. The other block is the coil sensitivity map, or let's say any, any four model unknown. And you could, and in the first iteration, you may update just images and you keep the theta unchanged. And in the other, and the next step, you could, for example, update the four model unknown, but you keep the images unchanged. And you keep doing it, keep doing it until you get the final result for both the images and the coil sensitivity map or the four model unknown. Yeah, the images is, yeah. And here's a remark here. So even though here we only consider two blocks, in principle, both the images and whatever form model unknown can be further decomposed into a small patches or into a small blocks. So which means here I only show you sample having two blocks, but in principle, you could have way more block. And, and this is the algorithm. I just, I just finished the algorithm of a block coordinate PMP and here's some theoretical results. I know there's a lot of, uh, equation word here, but I just try to give you a brief takeaway. So we have many assumptions here, but the key assumption is that we assume that the denoiser is a tra is, is trained to approximate the MMSE denoiser, which means that we assume the denoiser is so good, it can provide the best results, the best denoiser results. Uh, and this is the key assumption. And of course, we have another common assumption. But basically, what this algorithm or what this theorem could tell you is that the block coordinate PMP, BCPMP can converge. And you have a 1 over T rate of a convergence. And this whole theorem also related to the arrow in the approximated MMSE denoiser. So this is what the takeaway of the theorem. But if you're interested in the, in the details, you could check our paper. So now I'm showing you some uh, results. So this is the results of a BCPMP for joint image reconstruction and coil sensitivity estimation in parallel MI with six times acceleration acquisition. So you can see both the images and the coil sensitivity map is being updated. And we also uh, verify this algorithm in uh, bright imaging, sorry, bright imaging deburring, where you need to jointly estimate the images and also the Burry kernel. So here you can see uh, the BCPMP uh, perform better compared with traditional PMP without the mechanism to jointly update the, the, the Burry kernel. Uh, and if you compare like a uh, BCPMP with the, B, uh, the PMP Oracle theta, so again, the, B, the PMP oracle theta here 
meaning you run PMP, but you know the exact form model unknown. You know the, the perfect form model. So this figure highlights that the busy PMP nearly matched the performance of the Oracle PMP. So this is the takeaway of this figure. And last but not least, the, the results here, this is the result of the, uh, the convergence. So you can see the BCM PMP empirically does not diverge. It can converge and this algorithm is very stable. All right, now I close the, the discussion of the BCPMP for bright inverse problem. And I'm going to talk about the, the really, really last things. So BCPMP is a really good idea to solve bright inverse problem, but it's not the only way to do that because it's based on iterated algorithm. So inherently it could be slow and the, the performance could be suboptimal if you compare to end-to-end -end training. So the last things I'm going to talk about today is um, our work recently accepted in MIM. Uh, it's a journal in MI. It's a magnetic resonant medicine. Uh, it's, it's called like a Spicer. It's a self-supervised learning for MI with automatic coil sensitivity estimation and reconstruction. Uh, we just you just got acceptance. Uh, and this algorithm provides an alternative deep unfolding framework for solving bright inverse problem. So it's a different algorithm, is but still target on the bright inverse problem. So as you may know, it's uh, the deep unfolding because this is based on deep unfolding, right? Um, so deep unfolding you can consider as a, as a it's just a neural network architecture. But this architecture has a lot of uh, a layer, and each layer consists of a two parts. Uh, the first part is try to enforce the data consistency, and the second part is the CNN. I think about like a data consistency term right here. You need to get to know the the four model, the A theta here, in order to in order to to enforce the data consistency, right? Uh, but the idea of a bright inverse problem is that you don't know the exact four model. So how are we going to do that? It turns out it's, it's a really easy. So you just have another neural network to estimate whatever unknown in the form model and then to use it in the data consistency layer in the deep unfolding. So here example here is the uh, MI. So the form model unknown is the coil sensitivity. So you just put the raw measurement into another neural network, ask it to predict the coil sensitivity and you use this coil sensitivity in every data consistency block in the deep unfolding for the image reconstruction. And the loss function is somewhat similar to the, the, the first topic I, 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 did, I introduced. It's uh, based on self-supervised learning. You also have another measurement Y prime and the loss function is formulated by letting a neural network to predict another noisy measurement. Um, yeah, and the remark here is that the Spicer, this end-to-end -end framework could have a better performance than BCPMP because it's end-to-end -end training. And it, it should also be faster than the BCPMP because it's a neural network mapping. And here's the results of the Spicer. So uh, we compare Spicer with many other like algorithm, uh, also for self-supervised learning, also for like a, uh, John image reconstruction uh, and coil sensitive estimation in MI. And we and we found that like a spicer can get a really, really good results, even you are having a high acceleration factor. And the results here, we are doing experiments in 10 times acceleration factor. And you can see the imaging quality is still pretty good. And those are real data. So I usually close the talk by using this figure because I see it's really funny. So in the spicer, in the last work I introduced, right? We are doing the real data. So some of our lab member, including my device, Dr. Kamerov, we volunteer as a as, as a as a as a as a healthy, healthy subject in the MI scan. We just scan ourselves and then we get our, our own data and then we reconstruct our own data. And once we get the reconstruction, we could do a 3D rendering. And this is uh the 3D rendering of my my device. Um the, the funny thing is that I make this figure just for fun in private, but in terms of my device, I really like this 3D running, so I put it here because I feel like it's very funny. All right, that's everything about my talk. Let me draw a conclusion and also a takeaway. 
So the first topic is about learning on exact data. And I show you that if you don't have wrong true, you could consider the data set of a multiple noisy measurement of the same ground true. And first of all, I talk about is for deliver MI is a real application where you actually don't have ground true. And I show you an easiest way to get a training data set by doing partition on the temporal dimension. It's about algorithm and real application. And the second thing, uh, since if you are doing partition in the temporal dimension, you always have some motion or let's say deformation. And the second work I talk about in the first topic is uh, Decoran, the deformation compensated self-supervised learning for general dynamic imaging. Uh, it's also about algorithm and uh, algorithm and real application. The last work is not directly related to the first two work, but it is like a highly related and uh, provide a theoretical insight of why this training strategy works in a theoretical manner. It's about like an algorithm because it, it consider a new imaging model. We have our new self supervised logs with weighted matrix and DQ and so on. Uh, so it's a new algorithm and we also have a theoretical guarantee in these places. And the takeaway for the second part of my talk, learning on exact model, um, my solution is to formulate the problem as a bright inverse problem uh, and then we solve it. So the first way to solve it is uh, to do a broad coordinate. Uh, we propose like a broad coordinate plug and play method. The idea is to use pre-trade denoiser on the four model unknowns. Um, this is a new algorithm to solve the bright inverse problem. We also have some theoretical analysis on the convergence of a BCPMP. But we also, we, I also want to highlight that it's not the only way to solve this problem. We also introduce another, uh, like an end-to-end method as an alternative for potentially better performance to solve the price inverse problem. We also show that this algorithm works in some real application, real data. Uh, and this all the conclusion. And also I want to acknowledge my, uh, my friends, my colleague, my PhD mate, my advisors in WashU. Uh, and also I want to uh, acknowledge my uh, cooperator outside WashU, say in the national lab, in Siemens, uh, in another university in the US. Um, and I think that's all. Uh, thanks for listening. And I'm open to the question. Um, let me stop recording real quick.